welcome everybody. Um, welcome to um, our uh, our weekly webinar series. My name is Daniel Cap. Uh, for those of you who uh, usually attend this, I'm not Sally. Sally is out today, um, and when she's out, sometimes I get to uh, fill in for her. Um, and today we have uh, Caitlin Ackerhouse here uh, to talk about uh, our uh, a uh, fall bloomers and uh, some spooky arrangements. Uh, for those of you who have not been with us before, uh, this is a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting. So we cannot see you, but you will be able to uh, write questions that we'll be able to answer uh, on our Q&A box, or you can also use the chat box as well. Um, if uh, for this webinar, Caitlin asked that we're going to actually just kind of ask questions on the fly, uh, questions that are, are, of course, relevant and everything. And then if there is time at the end, then we'll also do more of a formal question and answer, but we might not get to that. If your question isn't answered or any or questions that isn't answered, you can always email Sally um, or uh, reach out to me through our contact us form on our website. I think that's about all the housekeeping that I need to do. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Caitlin, who is one of our um, buyers uh, over at our Maryfield Gallows Road location. She works in our perennials department and is just a wonderful plant geek and uh, a great arranger. Um, so Caitlin, I'm going to pass it off to you. All right. Thanks, Danny. Um, so this close going to be short lived because it's hot. But I will start off with a few arrangements and then I'm going to introduce you to some of my favorite fall bloomers. And then we'll finish up with a couple more really fun, spooky containers. So the first arrangement is one of my favorites. This is, I call it flying crow, flying dragon pot. Uh, so this really sharp, thorny plant right here, this is Ponsiris trifoliata, flying dragons, the cultivar. Uh, there will be photos and detailed lists of all the plants for each of these arrangements. Um, but this one is one of my all-time favorites for containers. It's a shrub that's going to get massive over time, anywhere from 8 feet to 15 feet. So after it's shown off for the fall season, then you probably want to plant it in the yard, maybe right next to your moat by the castle, because it'll keep out any intruders. It's also a wonderful shrub because it is fragrant. It's a hearty lemon, so the blossoms on it are wonderful. Fruit, not as tasty. And then I've got some massive creeping Jenny, the orange mum. You can't talk about fall without talking about your mums. Now, a lot of these mums we sell in our annuals department just because they're so florific, just covered in flowers right now. Uh, but they will return, especially if you're good about just deadheading the flowers when they're done leaving the plant in the ground, and then in the spring, it should return. Usually around June, July 1st, the latest, you can cut them down by six or eight inches, and that'll keep them more compact. That way, you've got a fuller, more round mum. I also threw in some black mondo grass to give an effect, and some pumpkins. And I will show each of you towards the end of the seminar how we get the pumpkins to stick in the pots. Now, the next pot is kind of a sibling container for this one. So you've got this really cool frost resistant container, looks almost like a dragon egg. And then I've got an Agastache. Uh, this is a hybrid, most likely of funiculum. Agastache is a wonderful, fun, full sun, drought tolerant plant. Pollinators love it, and it is one of the most long bloomers in the perennials department. And here is another close up of your Mondo grass, just to give you some texture. And then we've got a yellow mum, as well as some ornamental peppers and some more pumpkins and ivy cascading down. So that's really giving you that kapow, little dark side fall container look. This next one. This is more of a traditional fall container. So Penicetum alpicurides is a hardy grass. That's this one right here. This is cultivar Moundry. So Moundry stays below two feet. It's gonna be a short perennial. 
Um, however, they do spread fairly aggressively with seed. So you need to be wise where you're putting them in the flower bed. And if it's something that you don't want to come back, you can always use millet. Millet is another penicetum, it's clocum, and those are an annual in this area. So beautiful, wonderful feed for birds, both the apocurides as well as the millet. And it just adds a lot of fun texture. I really like the dark inflorescence or feathers is the name for this. And then I tossed in an aster. This is a New York aster hybrid. So New York asters are native to Virginia. Um, Novi Belgi is the species name. And then right next to it, I've got another really fun mum and Hugra obsidian. Those are those really dark grape-like looking leaves. Hugra is wonderful for the fall uh, because it comes in a bazillion different colors. The foliage on them looks like fallen fall leaves and they're semi-evergreen. So after a lot of this planter has fulfilled its purpose, I'll move the plants into the yard. The hookera I might recycle as a semi-evergreen in a winter container. So next I'm gonna introduce you to some of our perennials. I'm just gonna start right with my favorites. So this beauty right here, and I have probably talked about her before if this is not your first time watching anything I've done. This is Aster cordifolius, or heart-leafed aster. So these are absolutely gorgeous, really small asters. They appeal to a lot of our native bees that we have. So this is another native aster. And Aster cordifolius stays between two feet tall, maybe a little bit, yeah, two feet's about reasonable. And you'll see these hiking along Great Falls. Um, so it's one of my absolute favorite plants and it's a little drought resistant, but it's also shade tolerant. So don't put it in the darkest spot in the yard, but if you have an area that's only getting four hours of light where most asters would not comply, this aster will be more than happy to establish in that location. So Aster cordifolius, cultivar name is Avondale. One of my favorite plants to pair with this, excuse me, this is Helianthus augustifolius. So this is your swamp sunflowers. Swamp sunflowers can reach up to seven feet tall. That's going to be the straight species. Again, this is native. And this plant is gorgeous. It just blooms later than most other perennials. In fact, mine are just starting to crack open in the garden. And it, com it compares really nicely next to this because you've got broad texture, really delicate texture, bright yellows and blues. And both of these would grow really well together. Now, Helianthus augustifolius, we've got two cultivars right now at the Gallows Road location, as well as our other Maryfield branches. Um, first light gets to be between three and four feet tall. So that could be a plant that you have behind your asters. Or running alongside of them, we also sell one called Autumn Gold, and that stays around two feet tall. So these plants support over 75 different insect species. They are native. And the two of these are both deer resistant. So they are, they've been used for medical purposes and herbology but they are unpalatable to deer. So these are both plants that you could have and not feel concerned about your pets in the yard, but also not be stressing the deer, which is a fairly common issue that folks have when they're gardening. And then the third, this is Joe Pie. Eupatorium rugosa chocolate. So the chocolate has these really deep leaves, white clusters of flowers. This will also reach between two to three feet tall. And this is not the plant that you'll see growing along meadows or on the roadsides. That is another type of Eupatorium. Common name is bone set. Bone set will spread prolifically by seeds. This Eupatorium is not nearly as aggressive. In fact, I've had one for three years. I haven't seen it spread anywhere else besides the nice, really beautiful mound that just is beautiful, broad, deep foliage, and then shows off when most things are done blooming. So just throw those back here for now. 
Now, I did talk about deer resistance and being safe for kids. The next plant I will show you is not one to have in the yard if you've got curious little children. This is monk's hood, Aconitum arendensii. Um, so these plants do really well in Europe, into Asia, even by Nepal, and they thrive where it's cool climates, moist, rich soil conditions. And the reason why I said not to plant this if you've got kids nearby, this plant is botanical arsenic. So it's not very family friendly, but they definitely have been seen in every garden I've planted because they're gorgeous. They will reach average three to four feet tall. Mine are a little bit bigger. I think that's just because I have them in a little bit more shade. So the monk's hood likes just a few hours of sun and it'll be plenty content. If you have it in full sun, it's going to want a little bit more water, but by no means does that mean a boggy location. Also, it should be known that monk's hoods do not appreciate being transplanted. You can divide them late fall by pulling out a piece of the root chunk. Um, but again, this is just a gorgeous plant. Common name is monk's hood because the flower's got this little hood here and it was also revered by monks. It's also called wolf's bane because its poison was used for wolf's bait. And definitely a spooky plant. If you ever want to impress your garden buddies, just do a little more research on the history of wolf's bane. She's got a gothic history to her. Next plant, this is another non-native, but one of my favorite favorites. This is Tricertus herda or Sonome is the cultivar name. So these plants are really good for borders or right next to a seeding area because the orchid-like flowers can get lost in the back of a flower bed. There are shorter cultivars that stay around a foot and a half with variegated foliage. So Sonome will get to be about three feet. Normally it likes to cascade as you can see it's doing here, which causes a really nice effect along the entire limb, you'll get all these little buds. So it'll turn into an arm of just purple spotted flowers. And very late bloomer. Um, my Tricertus probably started blooming a month and a half ago and it's still going now. Um, but that's because mine again is in a little bit more shade. But Tricertus or toad lily, and these are also unpalatable to deer. Uh, rabbits might graze on some of the new growth in the spring but this is a very hardy plant and it's also very easy to self-propagate just by doing cuttings, put that stem in some water, you'll have a roots off of it within no time and then you've got another plant. So not native, but not invasive and easy to propagate. You can't go wrong with that. Next plant is Caryopterus. So Caryopterus starts blooming, I'd say mine was well over a month ago, so this one's on her way out. Uh, Caryopterus is another deer resistant. They do really well in full, full sun, really well draining conditions. Um, they kind of grow more so in like gravelly locations. Another non-native, this is from Asia, um, but pollinators like it all the same. Uh, you'll see them all over these. And these are nice just because they've got really fine flowers to them. So you can use them in an arrangement in your house in a vase with some broader flowers, or you can just enjoy them billowing in the yard. All right. This is the anemone. So this is a hybrid anemone. A lot of anemones like the whirlwind, honoring bear, Robotissima, those can get between three, even four feet tall. I'm a big fan of the fantasy series because they're more compact. This is fantasy series Red Riding Hood. So Red Riding Hood will stay around a foot and a half. And these are nice because they've got some really broad flowers. Anemone is the taller ones in full sun. Do require a little bit more water for maintenance, but the short varieties, they can handle full sun and they're a lot more drought tolerant. So anemones, even though they're in the shade section and they can do partial sun, um, planting some in full sun's more than reasonable. Okay, then I've got another part sun plant. This is Cleone. 
Leonii, this is turtle head. Turtle heads are really cool. Just their faces are awesome. They're like snapdragons with a little personality, a little snake tongue. And you can observe bees climbing into these. They are native, I believe it's from Ontario down to Albany. Um, so this is one of our native plants. And the Leonii come in two cultivars. We've got the taller hot lips, as well as the under two foot tall, a little deeper pink than these is gonna be the tiny tortuga. And these can tolerate a little bit more moist conditions in the soil. They can also tolerate a little bit of sun, um, but you're gonna maintain the watering more so. So very adaptable and a native. Next plant. All right. Now I've got goldenrod. So this is solar cascade. Solar cascade stays around four feet. Golden rods are pretty quick to self-propagate, um, but they're an absolutely gorgeous native wildflower that you will see pollinators all over. And it's a nice plant just to add some more bright texture. They're also pretty accommodating. Definitely don't plant them in less than six hours of sun or they'll be very leggy and scrawny looking, but they can grow in a variety of soils. And we do sell them in different sizes as well. The little lemon stays around a foot and a half. So if you love goldenrods, but don't want that massive mass of them, uh, this is a really good plant. And it's one that I enjoy, especially this time of year, whether it's hiking or in the garden bed. All right. So Amsonia. Amsonia is one of my favorites for fall foliage. Amsonia hubrechtii, which is the one I have here, is more so native to Arkansas. The um, Amsonia tabernae montana, which has more broad leaves that turn a deep purple, that's going to be more native to Virginia. Um, but this plant gets the same blue flowers in the spring, so it's pollinator friendly in that regard. It loves sun, it is drought tolerant, and in the fall, you've got this beautiful butterscotch colored foliage. I think these pair really well with the native nine barks or a cultivar with really dark leaves. So you've got some broad texture that really makes this light golden color pop off of it. Okay. And this one is fairly new. Um, at least to my eyes at Maryfield Garden Center. This is not a black-eyed Susan. It's not another helianthus. This is a coreopsis, a tick seed. This is coreopsis polystris or swamp tick seed. So these are naturally or natively occurring from North Carolina down to Texas. We are still within their hardiness zone. I just haven't seen them in Virginia. And even in their native range, they're fairly seldom, which is unfortunate because they can tolerate moist conditions. Uh, since we're a little bit north in their hardiness zone, you may not have to keep up with the watering as regularly. That being said, it may also not tolerate as boggy conditions as if it was warmer, like in Texas. Um, however, this plant has been plenty thirsty on our tables. And again, you'll see pollinators over it all the time. Also, its seeds are good food for songbirds. Um, so Coreopsis polystris, one of the many new natives that we are selling at Maryfield. Hey, Caitlin, um, yes. what was the flower that you were, had right before the one that you were just holding? The Amsonia? Yeah, so the not the yellow one that you just had, but the one right before them. This one? I believe that one, yes. Yes, so this is Amsonia hubrechtii, um, and this variety will get between two and three feet tall. Perfect. That was the one that our customer was asking about. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Uh, 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 while we were on the subject, for those of you wondering about all these plants, um, either you should have already gotten one or uh, it will be sent out later, but Caitlin has provided a full list of all the plants she's talking about today. Um, so... Uh, you'll be able to see what each one of those plants are, just in case. I spoke with Sally last night. She says she's going to make sure everyone gets the list after the course. Um, and that'll include, again, the plants and their names that I've been showing you today, as well as photos of the containers and then a breakdown of what's inside of them. All right. Now, 
back to some more asters. So these two right here, this is your New England aster, the purple one. This is Aster novi angli or symphytotrichum. And this is a purple dome is the cultivar for this. So another native aster. This is what I would consider more of a traditional aster with the really broad flowers. Late bloomer, you can't talk about fall bloomers without bringing up your asters. The next one is Aster laterifolius. Um, so Aster laterifolius, I see all over the place, just kind of reaching out of the grasses and the meadows. Um, it will get two to three feet tall, but really pretty flowers that are white. And as the flower matures, it'll get these little pink eyes to it. So this is another really wonderful aster. It's just, I prefer the ones that are more unique than your average aster. Not to say that there's anything wrong with the purple dome. I just like to mix it up with the texture sometimes. In fact, pairing them together, not a bad idea. So, now I'm gonna show you some of the containers that I put together. Uh, this one right here is a monster. Um, so this container right here, excuse me, I'm actually gonna get it a little lip. Perfect, get some height on it. All right. So this beast I call fall in love with pink. It's not like your traditional uh, hot oranges and yellows and purples. Instead, we've got some silvery foliage. The ornamental kale back here gives it a little bit of height. Um, the petals that you see shooting all over, this is another fantasy series anemone. So this is anemone uh, fantasy series Pocahontas. So Pocahontas is, single petal, very pale pink. And then I've got an ornamental cabbage right in front. It just looks like a little rosebud. And then to her right is one of my favorite hookahs. This is a, a hybrid. It is Carnival Peach Parfait. So it's really pretty, light pink color. It can tolerate full sun extremely drought tolerant, which is one of the reasons I love featuring hookahs in containers. I will reuse them, let them establish their roots, and then once they're more established, I'll plant them in the garden bed, and I'll dig the hole about the pot size and a half, and I'll do half to two-thirds Virginia fine mulch, and then mix in compost or Maryfield planting mix. Now the other plants I have in here, this is Carnival Watermelon Hookera. This is a little bit more of a deeper orange color, just to switch it up. And then we've got a really pretty deep rust orange mom in the front. This is a pansy. So the pansies are related to the violas. Violas are a little bit smaller in texture, and that just gives you a little bit more of a darker tone. And then I've got a pink Dazzleberry Sedum, which really fit the bill because of the silvery foliage as well as the um, calibricoas. And that's just giving you some spill in addition to Dichondra Silver Falls here. So one of the reasons I really like this planter is because most of the plants can be reused, if not in this pot, then in the flower bed, and they're going to hold up for a while. So the Dusty Millers are semi-evergreen. The cabbage and kale are both rock stars that are going to last for a while. The calibricoas will even survive a light frost, as will the dichondra. Those held on throughout much later in the season than I anticipated last year. The anemones, after a hard frost, when they're done and they go dormant, you just pull them out, put it in the yard, and you can fill that gap with pumpkins as you go along. All right. The next planter, just give me a second, I gotta beef up for this. Uh, oh, it wasn't so bad. It wasn't so bad at all. So this is another nice shallow pot, which just really allows for the plant material inside to show off. Not too different from the equation um, that we just saw. 
We've got two pumpkins. I have mixed some of the vines. So you've got Ivy and Creeping Jenny to give you texture. There is a cotton candy fern right here. This is an annual fern, which is really soft and fun to play with. And then this mum, this is Pink Frenzy. So not, again, not traditional fall colors, but definitely adds some drama. And uh, in the very front, this is Alyssum. Alyssum doesn't do too hot in our summer heat, but they're very happy in the fall and early spring. And of course, your cabbage and ornamental kale. All right. So, next container. This would be something that you could feature on your tabletop, or if you're leaving candy out for kids on Halloween, if you celebrate Halloween, this could be right next to that bowl of candy. So I tossed in a really cute little gnome that we sell in our stores. I've got some ivy and the cabbage, white alyssum, some purple violas. So these are the smaller variety. So the violas and their bigger cousins, the pansies, uh, what they're going to do is they'll show off for a long while during the heart of winter when I don't even want to be outside. They're going to be pretty chill. You're not going to see flowers, but they're the first things to start blooming again in spring. So if you're really just wanting to decorate the porch, you can always reuse these plants in the, in the flower beds. And they do not survive our summer heat, so come June, they're not going to be there. Well, maybe June, but July, not as much. Now I've got some sage right here. This is your purple leaf sage, which is also fairly cold hardy, as is another Dusty Miller, and then some dwarf mondo grass, just to kind of fill in that space and give some little texture. And here's another aster. So we do sell in four inch pots the asters in our annuals department, like the mums. These will come back. They came back and survived the past winter, which was really cold in my yard. And so this variety is another nice white New York aster. All right. Now, let's see. I think I'm going to pull up. Yeah. Okay. So right here, I have a pumpkin or rather a gourd, which has been carved out and filled with a variety of succulents. So these are house plants. So you can keep it on the dining room table if you're entertaining. Um, however, pumpkins tend to expire. So this one has a pot of succulents within the carved out pumpkin. So when the pumpkin is tired, starting to look a little funky, I can swap it out with another pumpkin. You could also keep it outside during warm days like today, but because it's tropical, um, I've got right here, this is your string of hearts, the variegated variety. There's also gonna be the string of turtles on this side. You've got some Semper Virens, hens and chicks, as well as a jade right there. And um, just, oh, this is a, what is it? Hawarthioid. So you've got a lot of really fun plants that you can keep outside on warm days or decorate the inside of the house and you can reuse the pumpkins or when it's all said and done, have a really fun plant of mixed succulents. So this not only is it in that plastic container in here to ensure that I can take it out and put it back in as I'd like, it also means that there's gonna be better drainage for these plants which are very drought tolerant. So make sure they're getting plenty of sun in your house. Keep that right there. All right. Excuse me again. So this little pot is a whole mess of fun, especially if you have kids. So what I've done is I took a bonsai from our tree and shrub section. This is a dwarf Japanese maple. It will outgrow this container with an amount of time, but if you're someone who enjoys doing fairy gardens or just, it's a beautiful little tree, it'll get really thick and it's fun to prune in the summer. Anyway, 
This is again a dwarf Japanese maple. I squeezed it into this window box. And then the next step I did was I planted some sagina or Scottish moss. So Scottish moss, as well as the deeper green Irish moss, we sell those in perennials. They are steppable. They do really well in full sun. So the moss that you see growing in those shady spots in your yard or under the porch, this is not going to behave the same way. They like moist, really well draining conditions. It always helps if you put a few rocks around the edge of the moss, just so it has something to crawl onto. After I got the moss into this planter, I added a bunch of our ground cover vinca vines. So that creates the illusion that you've got a pumpkin patch. And then the pumpkins, I did mention earlier, this is how we get them to stick tight. So we'll do a quick demonstration of that for you. It's nothing too advanced, but the pumpkins are usually the last thing that goes in and I'll usually hold the pumpkins in place before I start stabbing at them. So I'll keep that right there for now. And pumpkin stabbing. So right here's your pumpkin. I check to make sure it's gonna fit. Probably not ideal for this container, but what you're gonna do is take a screwdriver. This is just a smaller one that attaches to a hammer. And you're going to get it into the base of the pumpkin. I usually do a little bit of wriggling and then you can use a stake or you can take like an old chopstick and you just send that right through the hole. And then you're able to secure it into your planters without worrying about it wriggling or disappearing. It doesn't look good in that spot, but still serves the purpose of the demonstration and I can always put it in a different arrangement. So we'll squeeze her in right there in the back. Nice. All right, so, oh, and the Scarecrow, it's always fun to have a little craft project with the kids, or you can purchase miniature Scarecrows at craft stores or online. Um, but it just creates this really fun scene for kids or just kids at heart like myself. All right. Not as entertaining, a little more traditional, but still gorgeous. Um, I've got another box. This is a little stainless steel container. It doesn't have drainage on it. So what I had to do was layer about half an inch of rocks at the base. And then I took the small four inch um, violas. I've got purple ones in the back here to give some dark color, as well as this right here is a green spice hookera. Not as bold as some of the deeper colors or as bright as the oranges and pinks, but it's nice because it gets this really pretty red variegation to it. And then I've got ornamental peppers in the very front, another orange mum, and then the violas. And it's just spilling out with more of the ground cover vinca vine as well as the ivy. Um, both these ground covers will spread prolifically. So I'll use them in pots. If you have a spot in the yard that you want, really fast. These are the ones, but they can get a little crazy spreading. So just bear that in mind if you're going to reuse them in the yard. I just keep using them in containers. Uh, next, you've got your pumpkins and your gourds. So same as the other one, I always set the pumpkins and the gourds within the arrangement. So when you're doing the planting, bear in mind you want to leave a little extra space, which is normally not the case. We normally jam pack everything with plant material. Another trick is moss. So outside of our greenhouses, we sell this decorative moss. You can then use that as a little base for the pumpkins. The pumpkins always hold up better when they're resting on rocks or mulch or even the moss, just as long as they're not in the wet soil. Um, they'll last in the wet soil, just not as long as if they were resting on something that spares them that moisture. Okay, uh, next, let's put her right here. So for indoors, um, fun projects, I showed you the really pretty gourd that we had put together. Um, another fun project with kids 
is the Venus fly traps. I think the Venus fly traps add some really fun fall interest. Who doesn't like a coniferous plant? Uh, feed me, Seymour. Um, not a good impersonation, but still, it's not about me impersonating um, Little Shop of Horrors. It's about this plant, which is beautiful. Um, I like to leave a cover on mine so that it maintains the humidity. And then every week or so, I'll lift the lid off and sure enough, there's gonna be a little tiny gnat or a bug. I've got 200 house plants. So at some point, something's gonna cruise by for them to eat. And this does not have drainage on it. That was intentional because they like humidity as well as really moist conditions. So Venus fly traps, uh, I put together another arrangement using a skull mug with the fly traps coming out of the head. There were a lot of kids that were digging on that arrangement. And I've got this beast right here. So this right here is on loan. I have been calling around asking everyone if they had a skull that I could fill with greenhouse plants. And I was really, really, really lucky that a friend had this, not just cow skull, but it had been carved. So this is a little gory, but also glam. Um, the way that this was constructed was a lot of patience because I didn't want to damage it. Um, but I just started from the bottom up, like laying brickwork with all of the greenhouse succulents. So it's nice because it's in a waterproof tray. So when they do need water, I can take care of them. It needs to be placed at a sunny window, but when it comes time to host, you can just put them right in the middle of the table and it's definitely a conversation piece. So this again has more of the Semperverans, the hens and chicks, succulents from the greenhouse. Another way that I added texture to it was with these flowers and berries from the flower bed. So the blackberry lilies, the bellum pandas, if you have any in your yard, this time of year, their foliage looks like um, irises. And then what was once really sweet orange flowers, or if you get the straight species, massive flowers, um, turns into these seed pods. So they will self-propagate like monsters, especially the straight species of um, bellum candas. The freckle face that I have, I haven't seen it because it's a shorter cultivar. I haven't seen it self-propagate. But every fall I go out and I cut these to add into arrangements. Um, they hold up for, I've had mine in an arrangement for over a year now. So it gives you a really cool texture, especially when you incorporate it into something like this, where you need something dark. And then the other thing that I added, I entertained the idea of cutting thistles that I saw growing out of the meadow. Um, but those Canadian thistles are really unkind. So what I did was I took the dried flower heads off of the stochesia that I had growing in my pollinator garden. So stochesia is a Stokes aster. And this time of year, the foliage is still plenty happy. They're very cold hardy. Usually I cut mine back in the middle of winter because they'll hold up for so long. And then the flower heads, once I'm not hearing, any seeds in there, which I haven't had them propagate by seeds yet, but I try to leave as many seeds as I can. I will collect the dried flower heads and then employ them into an arrangement just like you would thistle. All right, and I think, did I get it all? Let me just make sure. <laughs> okay, that was good. All right. Do we have questions, Danny? No current questions, um, but we've had a couple people that have talked about how uh, wonderful the presentation has been uh, and uh, also some compliments on your cape. Oh, thrift <laughs> store. Although it was definitely very hot, but you can't be, I think it was like, 30 bucks for that wool cloak. <laughs> um, 
So I do apologize if that was really quick. I have a couple other plants I could show you as well as another arrangement. It just seemed like a lot to present in a short amount of time. So feel free to chime in with any questions, especially if I was going too quick at any points. And I'm gonna go grab a couple more things that I didn't think I'd have time to show you. Uh, before you go, I have one new question, which is, was there an oasis inside the containers that don't have drainage? No. Um, so with the skull here, no oasis. I did. Thank you for asking. That was a good question because this is a real skull. Um, so there were certain cavities within it that I needed to block up. I didn't want to be filling it with plants and soil. And then the first time I water it, I end up getting soil running out of the nose. That would have just not, that would have been too gory. Uh, so what I did was I took a weaving cloth and I cut it. And then I shoved that into where I wanted the soil to stop within the cranium. <laughs> I can't believe we're talking about these. Um, which, this is a really fun project. If you are a hunter or huntress, or you know anyone that has a random skull, this is super fun. They also sell resin ones online. Um, so this is something that you can definitely mess around with. But no need for the oasis on this. And because the um, stochesia buds, as well as the blackberry lilies, do just fine without water. Um, I was able to stick them into the drought tolerant soil of the succulents without having to worry about it. Um, the other thing that I did if I needed anything a little bit firmer than the weed cloth was I would employ some sphagnum moss on the opposite side. Not on the side with the soil, but just something to like kind of block it up and soak up extra moisture. So as I'm watering these plants that are stacked up like bricks from the bottom up, I don't have to worry about there being water issues or moss on them, as well as water running through the base of it. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions currently. Lots Solid. of praise, though. What's that? <laughs> Lots of praise, though. Everybody <laughs> loves your uh, arrangements. Thank you. Well, it's really fun because this time of year, we get to make art with pumpkins and hay bales and flowers. And it's like, once you start coming up with this stuff, like you will all get copies of the photos as well as the plant list. But I would encourage you not to copy them. You can copy them to, like identically, but mess around with it. Maybe there are certain colors I use that don't go with your house or you don't love. So it's always fun to mess around this time of year with some stuff. All right. Um, so one of the plants, that I didn't want to get too heavy into winter or fall, but this is one of my absolute favorites. This is Gullathera. I have also talked about this one before. So Gullathera procumbens, or winter green, is awesome. Their fruits provide a food source for mockingbirds. They're also minty and refreshing. It's not an overpowering mint, kind of a wuss when it comes to that, um, but they're pleasant to eat yourself as well as they are evergreen. Um, they will spread by roots, but I haven't seen them establish well in flower beds because they don't like our place soil, our heat or humidity. So this is a plant that is native to the Northeast. Um, however, it's found more along mountain areas. So if you're using it around here, I like to use them in winter planters or fall planters because they're evergreen. They also get this like almost purpley red deep hue to the foliage. And they're nice to just, I'll sneak them into the yard right on the edge of like a rock wall. So it's well draining, morning sun only, and they'll limp on throughout the summer. And then you can appreciate them fall, winter, early spring. So Gullathera procumbens, love this plant. We normally don't carry them in the summer because of the heat and the humidity, but if you're up for a challenge or even if you just want something gorgeous for fall as well as your winter containers, this is one of my go-tos. All right, and then the next arrangement I did not have up here because it's daunting in the weight of it, but it's a really pretty container. So that's the other thing when you're making stuff, 
at home or you're putting it together when you're shopping, I like to start with one plant, the one that's inspiring, just go through and see what's calling your name. And then the next thing's the container because the containers, the pots, the boxes, those are things that we reuse. So make sure that there's the plant that inspires you, the one thing you can build off of, and then the container that you're fond of. So the next arrangement I'll show you is probably my favorite container. All right. Why? Danny, if I break the desk, it wasn't me. It was David Yost. Um, oh my God. So this is an urn. Um, it's a very heavy stone urn with some really pretty flowers around it. Um, I really love this container. So the rest of it just kind of followed as an afterthought. Um, so the grass in the back is an evergreen grass. Most of our grasses that grow in the sun are not gonna be evergreen, but the Carex, as well as the Chorus, they can tolerate sun as well as their evergreen. This is Toffee Twister here. So it gives you height, evergreen. Then I have Celosia or Dragonfire. Another orange mum. Here's another ornamental cabbage. And then you've got some more of those peppers. So this container, I just was worried about breaking the table. Um, so I waited until now to bring it up to show everybody. Um, but again, pick out something that really inspires you and make sure that you love the containers that you're buying because the containers last much longer than plants that outgrow their homes. Oh, my God. So I have another question for you. Um, for the perennials that are in the containers, yeah. when would you plant them in the garden? In the spring or later? So that can always get a little bit weird. Um, and then I play it by ear. I kind of do it in the fall or I'll do it in the spring. The way that I will do them in the spring. If this, uh, let's scooch over my anemone pot here. This is a good example. Okay, so this pot right here is nice and thick. Um, it looks like terracotta, but it's not gonna crack. So terracotta over winter holds moisture and it'll crack when it freezes. So avoid terracotta when you're doing fall through, well, you can do it in fall, just don't have stuff in it throughout the winter. Since this is a thicker pot, it's not terracotta. What I will do is when the anemone is done blooming, the leaves have turned brown, I will cut it back. Then around November, we start to get in cut greens, everything from pine branches to red winter berries. And I will fill in where the mum no longer is. I will fill in where the anemone is no longer showing off and I'll keep the cabbage and the kales and the dusty millers, and I'll just pop in some branches. And most of the vines that I use, the vincas, the ivies, those are also evergreen. So it's really easy to plop a pumpkin there in their stead if things get really cold early. And then it's just as easy to cut out branches from your own yard or come visit us at our cut greens tent. And yes, once I cut it back, it chills out in the thick pot throughout the winter and then it goes in the yard in the spring. Just depends on time management. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got another question for you. Um, will Euphorbia ascot rainbow survive over the winter in a container and be okay for the next year in the container? And what so, about sedums? That's actually a really good question. I completely, I had a few pots with ascot rainbows and this has been a, difficult seminar to prepare for because they sold. Ascot rainbow euphorbia is evergreen. If it's in a very thin container or if it's a very cold winter and there's a lot of wind going, they can get a little bit of a wind burn. But for the most part, they're going to survive the winter and they'll survive the next year. I had one ascot rainbow euphorbia in a container for probably about two years, at which point it just got way too big and it was time to move it into the yard. But a lot of plants, 
they would prefer to be in the ground. The ground maintains a solid 32 degrees temperature. So it's a lot warmer if it's a very cold winter. It's like wearing snow pants in a storm versus a plastic pot. They're in shorts. They're feeling a little bit more exposed to the elements. That being said, a lot of my plants, I will have come back in containers. Sometimes I will reuse them and add spring stuff. Other times I'll get them in the ground in the fall. And I also keep shower curtains on hand for my containers. So like there were a few really, really cold, like below 20 degree evenings last winter. And I would just go out with an old clear shower curtain, throw them over the pots just to give them that extra security. I probably didn't need to, um, but I like to err on the side of caution because all of these plants are my babies and I just would rather them come back in the spring. So ideally, get them in the ground sooner. If you're enjoying them for too long and you have to pair Thanksgiving dinner or go Christmas shopping by the point they don't look good, then there are ways around it. And um, Ascot Rainbow is a really good long evergreen that you can maintain in a pot for a while. All right, wonderful. I, that is all the questions that we have right now. Does anybody else have any uh, more questions? Um, otherwise, I think um, we are about done then. Um, so let me just put myself back on as well so everybody can, well, people might be able to see me right now, but I can't see me. I see you. You see me? Oh, good. <laughs> um, oh, but one person, uh, and uh, the same person that was asking about the Last question was also asking about, um, uh, would you cut the euphorbia back? Only if it looks really rough. Um, usually mine don't get that rough. Uh, and again, that could be because of the shower curtain. What I do to not crush them with the shower curtain is I will take a plant stake. Um, excuse me. I'll put a couple of these in the pots and then I'll rest the shower curtain over it. If something is brown, my policies usually cut it down um, and it'll usually bounce back, but I try to maintain as much leaves on the ascot rainbows and the euphorbias and the drought tolerant plants. Uh, the sedums, those guys will hold on to their foliage for a while and it's usually like January and February that we get to cutting them back and nitpicking and cleaning them up at the garden center. Um, that's just because we get crazy busy with the Christmas stuff. But if it's brown, I usually cut stuff back. If it's not, I let it do photosynthesis and generate more of a root mass for the following year as long as I possibly can. All right, wonderful. Um, well, thank you for uh, all these arrangements today and thank you for answering all these questions. As always, you are a, a uh, 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 it's always great to watch you uh, talk about all these various plants and everything. I know we had a lot of people that um, were very interested uh, and uh, very appreciative of the uh, uh, arrangements that you did today. Um, I'm, I keep reading more and more right now, which is great. <laughs> um, uh, but for people, uh, if, if you wanna revisit this uh, webinar, um, we are, uh, I'm, I was recording this and we'll have that up uh, on our YouTube page, probably sometime tomorrow. Uh, if not tomorrow, then maybe later today. Um, and then if you guys have any further questions for Caitlin or myself or Sally, um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, most of you should have Sally's email. Um, and then uh, my, uh, I can be reached through our contact us form on our website. And, uh, and then you can always call our Merrifield Gallows location uh, to uh, get in contact with Caitlin. Uh, so hopefully we'll uh, see you guys next time. Uh, uh, and until then, have a great day. Bye-bye.